Parliament's Public Accounts Committee is taxed with the power to oversee the public purse. The committee has scrutinized public expenditure for over three decades, as captured in the Auditor General's report. To ensure their work is accurate and effective, the committee, comprising at most 25 members, is chaired by a member who does not belong to the ruling party. The question tonight is, what has this committee achieved? Despite having the powers of a high court, Park has struggled to have his voice heard and orders adhered to. What else could be done to empower the committee to ensure the effective use of public funds is adhered to? My guest tonight has been chair of Park for the last seven years and represented the people of Ketu North since 2005. Once deputy minority leader of the opposition party in parliament, he has decided to hang his parliamentary boots. I am Kemeni Amano and my guest tonight on Hot Issues is Dr. James Kluche Aveji. You're welcome to Hot Issues. Thank you very much. You have been crisscrossing the country. Yes. Uh, checking on the public purse. Yes. What are your observations so far? Well, um, the recent one that we have done um, were in Tamale, where the committee looked at uh, five regions, northern, upper east, upper west, savannah, and northeast regions. We were looking at four reports of the Auditor General. Mm -hmm. The management and utilization of the pub, uh, uh, District Assembly Common Fund, the District Assembly Common Fund uh, Assembly's IGF that the money they themselves generate. And then we're also looking at the report for the senior high schools and then the technical universities. What we have realized so far, basically with the technical universities and the senior high schools, is about on end salary, mm. where most of these uh, teachers and lecturers uh, who were sponsored by the government through steady leave with pay. So they go outside to study with the mind of acquiring more knowledge and come back to impact our young ones. But after the course, they don't return. I see. So the Auditor General will calculate all the salary they have received during the period mm -hmm. as money they have not earned. Mm. Once you refuse to come back to work, it means that government has given money for which no work was done. So it's one major issue that we have identified. It, it's been there in the past. We thought that it could come down based on some recommendations that we have made. Okay. But still, it's not coming down. What, what were those recommendations? Yes. The recommendations, what we... we Realize is that there is a, a guarantee system okay. where if you apply to go and study, sometimes government even pay for your uh, fees mm -hmm. and then also give you, pay your salary. You need people, at least two people to guarantee for your return. Mm. Now, this system is not working because the people who usually guarantee at the end, do not have the resources to pay. To pay back the money if, if, you, don't money return. if you don't return. Mm. So we have made a recommendation that, look, if you, if you want to get this sponsorship from government, the guarantee system should not be an individual or a human being that should come and sign a document to ensure that you return. But rather go to the bank and get a guarantee from the bank that the bank will ensure that you return. Mm -hmm. if, the, if you don't return, the bank pays the money. I see. So that's the recommendation we have made. And it's, to them, it's difficult to, well, the individual to get this bank guarantee. So the problem is still there. The question then is, why should government continue sponsoring people outside this country who will not return? Mm -hmm. Why should government continue to do it? Yes, they'll be earning salaries. Yes. So it's a, it's a dicey issue whether government should stop it or not. I mean, but, but what do you think? I think that government should not stop it 
because some of these um, areas where they go to study are very important and needed. We need those, those capacities here in our educational sector. Mm -hmm. Now, it is not everybody who goes there who do not return. Mm -hmm. It's very few of them, or a sizable number, let me put it that way. So if government, because of that, government stop it, we'll be lacking some expertise in our tertiary institutions. So definitely, government should not stop it. But the guarantor system should be strengthened. It should be strengthened. Such that if you go and you don't come back, government will not lose that money. Mm. Yeah, that is what we have recommended. We, we don't recommend that government should stop it. Completely. I mean, how, how widespread is this practice? It is basically common in the technical universities and the traditional universities. Right. So if you, if you go to, if you look at the report of the Orator General, you see universities like uh, University of Ghana, mm -hmm. uh, University of uh, Kwame Nkrumah, University of Science and Technology, uh, University of Cape Coast, and all the technical universities are cited in a report that lecturers who benefit from this program, some of them do not return. Hmm. So yeah. this, that is the basic thing that we, we, are, we have You're observing. The other one is about procurement. Procurement is an area where government lose a lot of money. We have a law, procurement law, or yeah, procurement law, which is at CC3. And we have a procurement authority who is more or less like um, a regulator mm -hmm. in, the, in the procurement business. But you see most government institutions not going through the procurement process, but rather asking the procurement authority to grant them permission to so source. Now, there are conditions that are needed if you want to do sole sourcing. Mm -hmm. Now, they will not meet those conditions. But you apply to the procurement authority to grant them permission to so source. And the procurement authority also go ahead to grant them. What do you identify is the problem with why um, these institutions and government offices do not adhere to the procurement laws? Because if they go according to the procurement methods that we have, where everything is transparent, companies who buy the bid form and bid for the projects, they probably they might not get their cuts. Mm. But if I want you to do the job for me, I'll have a discussion with you that this is my cut. Then I'll apply to procurement authority to grant me permission to so solve that contract from your company. It's easy. And then the authority grants it. Of course. But do you, do you also uh, consider the authorities, uh, you know, granting the uh, sole sourcing letters or requests problematic? I yes, mean, wh why, why do you think that they are not doing their jobs? I have said it some time back, um, I think less than two months ago, that look, what we have realized as the reason why the procurement authority is doing that is that the head or the people there, most of them, one, their salaries are nothing to write home about. They take a very meager salary. There was an issue in the 2022 report, which we look at, where a lawyer was employed or recruited as a legal person for the authority. And this lawyer was being paid 4,000 Ghana cities as his or her salary. Mm -hmm. Now, that was on contracts. But when this lawyer was regularized, go through the um, Public Service Commission, eventually giving an appointment letter the salary dropped to 2,000 Ghana cities. Which means that most of, and that 2,000 Ghana cities was even better than most of the workers in that office. So if a lawyer who was enga engaged on contract was being paid 4,000, mm -hmm. and then the 
actual salary has dropped down to 2,000, what the procurement authority or the board did was that, look, if we don't do anything about this, we'll lose this lawyer. So let's top up with the 2,000 so that we can maintain the 4,000 that he or she was receiving. The auditors cited that one, a salary that the person did not earn. And, and the auditors were right, because the salary on the appointment letter is 2,000, okay? So that issue came before my committee, and I look at it and I say, how? So we decided to recommend that, look, the difference that was being given to that person as a top up, which was cited as on end salary, right. should be written off. Mm, I see. And we have done that. And so we realized that the salaries is one motivating factor that when these requests come to them, probably mm. with some pairs, <laughs> they'll be I willing. See. Do, do, they are willing to circumvent the, the law. But you, you, you've spoken about challenges of the authority. I want, I want to understand what the challenges are for PAC in the discharge of his duties. Well, for us, um, the only challenge that we, we see is that the, the authority is approving all requests for sole sourcing. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge for us. If the authority should insist that if the request for sole sourcing does not qualify based on the criteria cite, uh, stated in the law, mm -hmm. then it is not every request that comes to the authority that will be approved. For that matter, it will help the un uh, entity that are requesting for that to go through the normal process and to do the procurement. Government will be saving a lot of money. In the discharge of your duty as, you know, uh, the Public Accounts Committee, uh, do you experience any um, obstacles, any fight back? What makes your work difficult? Well, I think that one major thing that is not giving the committee an encouragement is the implementation of our recommendations. Mm. The, the constitution was clear on what a committee of parliament can do. And then also the constitution in Article 103 talk about the powers of that committee. Mm -hmm. We are not uh, a court. The Public Accounts Committee is not a court. The Constitution only says that the committee, when sitting, uh, has the powers of a high court. And these powers of a high court are limited to only three things. The power to call witnesses and examine them on oath. Mm -hmm. Now, the power to demand documentations. So that is where, when we sit, we, we ask for any document. We have to produce it. And then the power to call for examining witnesses outside Ghana, mm -hmm. which we have never uh, uh, utilized. So that is a, the limit to which our powers as a sitting as a high court ends. We don't have the power to prescribe punishments. Mm -hmm. Because it's a, it's a court that has the power to interpret the laws that we have. We, sitting as a committee, want to know that what we have done as a government entity, have you followed the law? The financial law that we are using in Ghana, your action, does it fall in line with that law? So, I mean, there's no denying that the committee puts in a lot of work. Yeah. So if your work then ends at recommendations that may or may not be followed, mm. then it means you're not, you're not getting results. Yes, we're not getting results because when we look at all these things in the public um, auditor general report, we make our recommendations. And if you look at our report, you can see a number of recommendations virtually on every area that the auditor general has identified. We'll do our recommendation. Those that they need to be prosecuted, mm. we'll do the recommendation that look, based on the findings of the auditor general, this institution, institution must be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. That is all that we can do. We'll present our report to Parliament. We'll move the motion. We'll debate it. We'll, 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 we'll defend why we think that this person or that should be prosecuted. Now, 
members of parliament will contribute it to the debate. At the end, we take a decision by voting. If our reports are adopted by the House, it becomes the legal document that must be implemented. Now, it is for the parliamentary service to communicate to the appropriate authority that need to take action. That look, on so and so the parliament through res uh, resolution or through um, voice vote or whatever have approved that this report of the, uh, of the uh, Public Accounts Committee, this recommendation in the report, I refer to you for action. Okay. So if it is for prescription, this communication will go to the Attorney General's office. Then the Attorney General will then commence its work and prosecute the people. I see. But all these recommendations we have done in the past, no communication has come from Parliament to the appropriate quarters. So, Is it? Yes. If you look at the 2020 report, if you mm -hmm. look at the 2021 report, we have made some recommendations for institutions, not human individuals, institutions. We can, let me give you one example. We realize that uh, Ghana Manufacturing, uh, Cylinder Manufacturing Company have done sole sourcing to the tune of millions of dollars. And we realize that no, this person or the institution need to be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. We have made that recommendation. No communication has gone to the Attorney General. So since no communication has gone to the Attorney General, Attorney General says, I cannot take any action because nobody has communicated to me, giving me a copy of the report mm -hmm. that this institution need to be prosecuted. So they have not started any action. Okay. The people so who did that are working freely. I see. Yes. So, so you, you know, from my understanding, the committee is also taxed with doing follow-ups on these recommendations. Yeah. If the if the the the, the communication need to go to the appropriate quarters to take action is not gone, what are we going to follow? So, so what is the you know response you're getting from uh, the parliamentary service as to why those recommendations the, are not pushing the, through? I, I have followed this severally, and the information to me is that oh, they are working on it. They will send it. They will mm. send it. They will send it. I'm, I'm even fed up Do now. Do you consider that bureaucratic? I think so. I think that somebody is not doing his work. I think that somebody, either intentionally or whatever, is not doing his work. Because it's just a, a normal, simple letter mm -hmm. that Parliament has taken this decision. It is being referred to you now for action. If that cannot be done, then... You're not doing your work. And then it also impacts you. It makes you look like a... It looks like... Non-performing non -performing. committee. And when we go to the regions, all the, the schools, the assemblies that we are referred for prosecution as a result of procurement breaches. When we ask them, has you been, have you been contacted by the Attorney General? They say That's no. It. So then, Doc, we, we are, don't we have are, the motivation to even refer anybody again. Then, Doc, we are wasting taxpayer money you know, taking the committee around yeah. <laughs> to be doing these uh, oversights, performing their oversight duty? Well, I think that our work actually is bringing up everything because we even show it live, our proceedings. So mm -hmm. at least Ghanaians are getting to know that this is what, this is, going is, what is going on. Uh -huh. But what Ghanaians do not know is that where they blame the committee all the time is that, oh, we see all these things, but we don't know the outcome. We don't know the end result of what we have watched you mm. uh, during your public hearing. They don't see the end result. But if what I've just said it was done correctly, end result will then come to the people. Now, our findings or our, the work that we do come in, the, in, the, in stages. One, when we go, there are issues that before we get there, the institutions involved have resolved it. Mm -hmm. We don't have any problem with that. Once they know public accounts committee is coming, they go quickly go and resolve the issue. The auditors confirm that issue have been resolved. We end it there. Those that have not been resolved are the ones you move forward. who move forward, made a recommendation. And those that cannot be resolved because, for instance, procurement breaches, how can it be resolved? Mm -hmm. It cannot. So we refer that to the attorney general for prosecution. I see. Those are the ones that end result is not known to the public. I see. Doc, 
We'll talk more about your sittings and we'll pay particular attention to a few of the reports that have come up. Okay. When we come back, don't go away. My guest tonight is Dr. James Kluche Averji. He's member of parliament for K2 North. He's also chairperson for parliament's public accounts committee. And we've been talking about the assistance and some of the challenges they experience. We'll continue the conversation at this point. Speaking of your powers, I know this year you, or was it last year, you caused the arrest of <laughs> two people. Where did you derive the power to do that? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't cause the arrest. Uh, per se. What really happened was that there were two uh, finance officers from a district assembly. Sefia Contumbra. Yes. They came to the committee to inform the committee that the issue is about unpresented PVs. Mm -hmm. You make payment. You prepare a payment voucher. But when the auditors came, you could not present a payment voucher to the auditors to review. So, and the question was, where were the payment vouchers and what are they? Now, they lie to the committee. We saw it, we knew that what they were telling us was not true because the auditors had already briefed us. So, because that accountant involved, the first accountant was transferred. I said, okay, fine, we will not consider your issue. Mm -hmm. Go and come the following week. Bring that accountant along. So the two of you should come to the committee. And we had a briefing all, all already on the issue. When they came, the, what they presented the previous week, completely different from what they were presenting the following week. Apparently, they had even gone to talk to the auditors and look, please, uh, forgive us or protect us. Mm -hmm. So we had all this information. So we realized that these people just want to come and throw dust into the eyes of the committee members. Mm -hmm. They think that we don't know anything. I said, if you could say this today, and tomorrow you are saying different things, go to the police station in the parliament house. Go mm -hmm. and take, the, take a statement. Write a statement so that we know exactly what is your official position. Then the police can take over. We will not take over. We will not do anything because that's the best thing we can do. Now, that brings to the fore the powers of the Public Accounts Committee. Yes. If we should have powers that on the spot, when we know that Officer A is not telling the truth, we can hand over this officer to the police and then ask the police in, in Parliament to prosecute them. Right, so you didn't call Parliament police to come and arrest them in, the two of them? Anytime we are sitting, mm -hmm. the Parliament of, uh, police officers are all the way with us. Now, to ensure that there is peace in, in around, because mm -hmm. it, you are meeting people who probably, not all of them, but some of them who have done something wrong. So when they are coming there, you don't know what you come to do. So we bring the police to be in our midst. Mm -hmm. So it was easier for me to ask the police who were standing somewhere that, take them to the station so that they can write their statement. Yeah. And the men ended up in handcuffs. Yeah, <laughs> of course. So, Doc, doc what, what can be done mm. to empower PAC? Well, I think that um, PAC should not, have the, should not have the powers of prosecution. Mm -hmm. So that should be left to the Attorney General or the Office of the Special Prosecutor. But PAC should be having certain powers that uh, we should not wait to report issues that we have found during our public hearing to recommendations in our report, which need to be adopted by the House before action is taken. APAC PAC has some powers that instantly, where we identify that Officer A or 2 is involved in something fishy, would do a direct or immediate recommendation for the authority to take action. Mm -hmm. In fact, in some jurisdictions, I can talk about Uganda, I can talk about Kenya and, and the rest. As soon as they identify that you have been cited in the report and during their public hearing, they know that this is something that needs to be taken action or need to be prosecuted, immediately 
they will refer you. The police will pick you. They will lock you. Mm. And then prosecution starts. But right. we don't have that power. So it's like people are thinking that, look, we appear before the Public Accounts Committee. Right. Um, they will tell us all that they know. They will, they will prepare a report. The report is sent to Parliament. The House debate the report and they adopt it. We don't hear anything again. That is why the, 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 the people continue to do what they are doing. They do. Yeah. Because the investigation you conduct more or less does not go anywhere. Exactly. I see. I want us to look at some specifics now. Okay. Mm. Um, let's start off with 2020 mm. um, when PAC was petitioned to investigate 52.5 billion cities mm. that had been transferred into mm. an unknown mm. account mm. that year, mm. a GCB account. Mm. What became of that? We did not take any action. Uh, first of all, the procedure for petition is clearly in our uh, standing orders. Mm -hmm. That if you want to petition a committee or parliament, you don't do it directly to the committee. To the committee. Mm. Our committees are assumed to be the speaker's committee. So you have to petition the speaker. The speaker will then refer the issue to the appropriate quarters for the committee to sit on it and then report back to the House before Speaker will take action. So when that petition was sent to my office, mm -hmm. I called the petitioner and I told him that, look, the, the proper procedure is to petition the Speaker. And then Speaker will refer it to us. So we did not take any action because we don't have the powers to receive petitions okay. and start working but, on but, but my understanding from what the petitioner said mm. uh, then is the fact that uh, the transfer of the said amount, mm. which at the time was nine point something billion dollars, mm. three times what we are looking for, for from the IMF. Mm. Uh, at the time that petition was sent to you, it was already cap captured in the 2020 audit report, which means that you have seen it already. No, it, that issue was not captured in any audit report. Okay. It was a letter which was signed by the Deputy Auditor General to the um, managing director of GCB mm -hmm. to explain that where those transfers went to. So it wasn't captured in any other reports. So it, is, it wasn't before the committee. Now, if it was captured in the other report, basically that report was referred to the Public Accounts Committee mm -hmm. or every report referred to the Public Accounts Committee by the speaker would have gotten that as part of our work and would have gone ahead and worked I on see. it. But it wasn't captured in any report at all. It was a letter which was leaked to the public. So as of now, we still don't know what happened no, we to don't that know. money. We don't know. Because today it will be more than $9 billion. Dollars. Yeah, we, we don't know. Because even, even I took a personal interest and, mm. and, and, and called the, the Auditor General to find out a little bit of that. And... Uh, the responses I got wasn't pleasant. What kind of responses did you get? Well, he was referring to his uh, then the deputy auditor general as the one who did that job. And he should have done it, blah, blah, a lot of things. So I didn't want to go into it. And, into and this auditor general you're referring to is the, the current, current, the current auditor, auditor general? general. Yes, mm. the current auditor general. I see. Mm. The issue I want us to tackle now is the COVID-19 funds, which you had called on mm. uh, the minister mm. to come to you mm. and come and tell you how it was used. Subsequently, he presented uh, a document to parliament. Mm. I can assure you that the report of the auditor general on the COVID-19 expenditure is before the committee. It will be sitting on it. I see. This when, year. when? This year. You sit on it Very this soon. year? We we'll sit on it I see. this year. That's, that's a, a reassuring. Yes. Well, we, the report is referred to us. Once the report is referred to us, we'll work on it. And we're definitely going to sit on it this year, on the COVID-19 report. It is, the audit was done. Mm -hmm. The report submitted to Parliament. The speaker referred the report to the Public Accounts Committee, right. and so we are going to sit on it. Were there any staggering figures in that report, I as far as you are concerned? I, I haven't taken a critical look at it. Mm. One thing about me is that when I'm going to work on a report, it is then that I take the report right. and study it, and then I uh, work on it. Because if I do it, if, if I do it and I'm not sitting on it immediately, probably I may 
uh, forget about a lot of things. So when the time has come and we are inviting the appropriate people to appear, I'll well, look at the numbers in the report. Well, we can't wait to hear uh, yeah, you, 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 how you, the 46 you hear, billion cities you hear, collected. You hear from the committee. According we'll definitely to, work on that. Mm. We look forward to mm. that. Mm. Now let's look at ECG. ECG was one of those uh, public corporations mm. that appeared before mm. uh, the committee. Yes. Now, um, another problem we have seen with ECG mm. is, is the Amani situation. Based on what you have seen, is ECG a profitable venture? ECG should be a profitable venture, but I think that currently that is not the case. Uh, ECG is a problem with their revenue. Uh, basically, one, ECG is not allowed to determine their own rates. Mm -hmm. Their rate is determined by PURC. Uh, Secondly, PUC at uh, ECG lose a lot of revenue through theft of power. Mm -hmm. And um, so if ECG is able to focus on that area where more than 30% of power they produce go waste or uh, through theft, if they're able to block that area, then they can make a lot of revenue and can make the organization or the company more profitable. Uh, currently, there are a lot of customers who owe ECG. Mm -hmm. And ECG also owe VRA as well as Gridco. So when you take a particular year's report, you can see that all the players in the power sector are owing each other. ECG, which is the distributor of the power, mm -hmm. buy from VRA, Gridco, and sometimes Bui Power. Okay. And then when they sell the power to the public, because some portion go through theft, they cannot realize their revenue. And then also most of the people, uh, the consumers are owing, and especially government entities are owing ECG. So ECG is not able to collect those revenue. Mm. So they cannot pay VRA. They cannot pay Gridco and Bui Power. But, but this, that year, is why the problem this year in particular, the ECG has told us they've collected quite, you know, substantial amount that was, of money. That, that was a, a, a project that... Yeah, when they, they did their drive. On. Right. So, that, so it means that there is the they potential can, to be able exactly, to do that. Exactly. Now, the, the other thing I want to ask, based on the picture you have seen of their, of, of their audits mm. and the work you have done on mm. those audits, is whether or not it paints a picture of what ECG uses its money for and why it's not been able to pay, you know, the, the, the value chain through the cash water mechanism, mm. cash water fall mechanism. Yeah. Well, I think that the cash waterfall mechanism is helping a lot so that when the money comes into that port, the situation is done in such a way that you, the power producer, can also get some. And all those people who need have contributed can get some. And that is where we, we, we think that the, the, even though the debt is increasing, it is something that at the end of the month, when the distribution is done, you, the power producer, VRA and co, will be assured that you definitely get something. Yeah, but when they collect the money, what do they use for, based on the audit of their, of their books that you've seen? It will not show clearly in the audits. Right. It can only show in the audit that, look, there are three main items in the <coughs> report. Mm -hmm. When we look at the UCG financial statement, it will tell you their revenue. Which is, uh, where are they getting the revenue from? Or oh, from sale of power, basically from that. And how do they spend that money? They spend X amount of money to pay salaries. So we call it personal emolument. Or they spend money for goods and services, for running costs of their work. Third, they spend part of the money for capital expenditure. Probably they went and bought more transformers and the rest. Mm. Those are the only three areas, ball figures. Now, whether those items they bought 
in terms of the capital expenditure, the money they spend in acquiring those quantity of items is actually economical or not. Our report that comes to us will not show it. Based on the performance of ECG, mm -hmm. is it time we begin to think about privatization again? Of the company. Of the company, aspects of the company, however. Well, if we talk about privatization, it means that uh, you want to make, make ECG a complete private business. What we should be thinking of is the ability of Ghanaians to afford the power uh, price. That is, should be the factor to decide. Uh -huh. If we make it complete private, a private man goes with profit motive. And the private man cannot sell power to you if he's not making any profit or desire profit. So that should be the factor that should tell us whether, are we Ghanaians prepared to pay that price mm -hmm. for the private person to provide us with power? Mm -hmm. Now, as a consumer, you, you should decide. Oh, yesterday, my, my house, that was low uh, power uh, out, uh, supply. Mm -hmm. We could not carry anything in the house. Or should I pay higher so that uh, all the time I have power in my house? That should be a decision for we, the consumer, should also make. Should we continue with ECG where we don't have power? A day you're off, uh, the next day you don't even know because there's no timetable. You don't even know your power will go off or... You, you have power, or you pay higher so that you are sure that every day you have power. That should also be a decision for we, the in consumers, to, to do. But the government, mm -hmm. the government um, considering power as a, uh, uh, public goods, must do more investment into that sector. Into the sector. Put in proper management that will ensure that power is produced and sold to the people all the time mm -hmm. at the rate that the people can afford. One of the things that your report has made mention of, particularly at the MMDC level, mm. is the lack of knowledge of the Procurement Act or just flagrant abuse of it. Are we employing the right people at those levels based on what you have seen and experienced? I will not be able to know if now right people are being employed. But I think that based on my work, the people who are there, they know the right thing. They know the right thing. Mm. They're just not doing They're it. They're just not doing it. Okay. Mm. I see. Yes. I, I want to wrap it up on ECG. Mm. In your 2021 report, mm. which is your probing to the 2020 uh, Auditor General's report, okay. you cite the ECG for making procurement with no consideration for value of money. That's right. And you say, well, the Auditor General cited them. Yeah. And we lost some over $2 million, yes. almost $3 million. Yes. Have we collected that money? No. It's, if you read the report, you see that we have referred this to the Attorney General for prosecution. I see that. Yes. It is when the Attorney General takes action on them and they go to court. That we can collect the money? Before the details of the court, when the court process ends, the judge will then decide based on what the law says that, look, this money needs to be collected back or need to be paid by A, B, C, or whoever. Because we have not gone through that process, that money has not been collected. So $2 million? Yes, it hasn't been collected. We don't know where yeah. it is. Yeah. There yes. No yeah. value for money? No. Because... And because, ECG is crying for... Yes. Because they have not been prosecuted. Nothing has gone to court. When they go to court, details of the matter will come up in court. They will make the argument, and at the end, the judge will then pronounce his judgment. But nothing of this has, has taken place. When you look at the level of infractions that ECG alone has committed mm. in that year, <laughs> in, you know, in the year under review, mm. all over the country, it goes to Ashanti region yeah. and, and, and the greater Accra region, yeah. all over the yeah, country. Over. Mm. I mean, what, what, paint, what picture does it paint for you of how ECG is being run? I think that um, the, the ECG as a company because it's a company, mm -hmm. um, uh, even though owned by government, it's a company who, uh, which apply the company's act, uh, has a management board, uh, has um, uh, um, the, the, the top management workers and the rest. It's like that 
I think that people think that the ECG is for government. So that seriousness that is attached to a private company is not being attached. That is the way I see it. Mm. I might be right or wrong, but I think that we need more stronger hands on how UCG activities can be uh, managed. And then we also need a stronger internal control system to mm. be put in place so that every activity of every worker of, uh, of UCG can fall in line with that control mechanism. Once we have a control mechanism, everything will work well. So if you see auditors go to audit you and you have realized that certain things are not being followed well, they'll they will comment on the internal control mechanism. And that is what should be done at the ECG. A proper assessment of what kind of internal control mechanism need to be put in place at a company of this nature, which mm. covered all, almost the entire country, so that people cannot on their own do things that will not come to the uh, knowledge of the management. Very well. When we come back, I want us to look at uh, other reports from mm. the same year okay. that you reviewed the Auditor General's report. Mm. Don't go away. You're still watching Hot Issues with me, Kemeni Amano. My guest tonight is Dr. James Kluche Aveji. He is a member of parliament for K2 North. He's also the chairperson of the Public Accounts Committee, and we are discussing their work generally. Soon we'll shift into politics. Mm -hmm. um, Ghana's Consolidated Fund mm. is one of those uh, mm. you know, public pairs yeah. you, look, you yeah. look at. How are we doing? What do the books look like? Well, the report of the Auditor General on the Ghana Consultative Fund, um, which we call a uh, whole government account. Mm -hmm. That is the new report they are preparing now. They look at the, the central government accounts. They add the local government account to it. And then they also add the uh, boards and public boards and corporations mm -hmm. account to it. Then you have a total column, they'll call it a whole government account. Yes. So if you take that report and look at the report, you can see clearly how much we are worth as a country. Are we broke? I wouldn't say we are broke. But we are poor. But no. Is there a difference between broke and poor? Well, poor, maybe you have a little. Broke, you don't have. Because, okay, let me put it this way. You can see clearly that our debts keep rising. Our debt level keep rising. We look at the 2022 um, report of the Auditor General, and our total debt is well over 600 billion Ghana cities. 600 billion Ghana cities. In 2017 reports, no, 2018, 2016 report of the Auditor General, mm -hmm. Ghana was owing 120 billion Ghana cities. 120 billion Ghana cities. And if you remember, the current government was on the street shouting that the country was broke because uh, the previous government has taken uh, the country into debt because mm -hmm. we borrow over borrow. Now, from that time, January 2017 or December 2016 to December 2022, that is six years. Our total public debt has gone beyond 600 billion Ghana cities. So that is where we are. You need to compare that with your assets. And if you look at the assets that we have as a country, the debt, which is a liability portion, is far outweigh the asset portion, mm. the asset we have. So we can say we are in debt. We're Not that debt. we are broke, but we are in debt because if you compare our assets and our liability, our liability is more 
than the asset. We'll, we'll switch gear mm. and, and talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, other sectors. Okay. I know you have seen uh, uh, SNES books as well. They were before you this, uh, this year, mm. is it, mm. um, at the Public Accounts Committee. Mm. We also know at the same time the ILO had talked about SNET mm. uh, not being the reserves of SNET depleting by 2036. Mm. It has got SNET, SNET on a, a an explanation tour mm. since the ILO report Important. came. Mm. But you have seen the books. Is SNET entering profitable ventures for pensioners? Could this be a real problem for SNET in the near future? I think there's a problem for SNET in the near future. Those reports or issues that have come before the Public Accounts Committee, that SNET has undertaking some investments which are not profitable at all. In fact, um, the report that we look at before, the 20, 2021 reports, there were a number of investments was made by SNED into housing sector, um, hotel business and the rest, which were not profitable at all. Mm. Yes, not profitable. And so I wasn't surprised when ILO report came that the results of SNIT is depleting and it takes 12 years, mm -hmm. if nothing is done. After 12 years, be pensioners to will not have money to, 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 to take. So it's, 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 it's real. It, it's real. That's a big security Something issue. Something must be done about the work of SNIT mm. because most of the investment that they have, in, they have taken are not profitable. What could be done? It, we at the committee advise them that, look, before you enter into any investment, do proper analysis to know that this investment will be profitable and will bring money to them. because look you are holding people's fund mm -hmm. you don't put a fund down without growing the money because as the days go by you need to pay more people uh, 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 and, and, and a pension that can keep them until they pass on so when you want to go into an investment Make sure that those, that investment will definitely bring in returns that will grow the money so that when you are paying the, your pensioners, you still have something at, at, your, uh, at, at your reserve. We advise that. That is all that we can do as a committee. Proper management, uh, people with management uh, uh, experience must be at that point so that they can take management decisions that will grow our money. If we don't do that, Answer by uh, ALO, they, then it means that uh, after 12 years, um, maybe by that time, you are not even getting to a retirement age. Those of us who are retiring, <laughs> who, after 12 years, will not have any money again. Let's talk about parliament now. Mm. You're not coming back. No, I'm not. You stepped off from the elections. Yes. Why? Um, I believe strongly that one person one person alone cannot do everything. There is time to buy out. And there is a saying by Patrice Lumumba, says that the best time to get off the stage is when the applause is loud. Mm -hmm. When everybody is clapping for you, that is a time to bow out quietly. If you insist, uh, to stay on, people will not even consider you to be a relevant person again. I felt within me that this is the time for me to leave the scene. I see. Let a new, a younger people come on board. And, and you know, for them th also this, this had nothing to do with perhaps you being the running to partner John Ramani Mahama no, no, on the no, ticket. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. Not but at were all. you? Were you under consideration for that? No, I don't know. You don't know. I wouldn't know because <laughs> nobody approached me. Nobody approached you. <laughs> I see. But what, what will uh, Ketu North remember you for? A lot. A lot. I have done, through my work as a member of parliament, brought in the basic needs of every human being. Um, as we are growing as a country, we need to have some basic thing that will help our life. We talk about road network for businesses, to, for, for market women, farmers to take their goods from their villages to the market center. We have done quite a number of roads in Ketunov. We talk about electricity. 
where over 160 communities have been connected mm. during my period as a member of parliament and still working to connect more people before I leave, the smallest village are connected to the electricity. That is one thing to remember me of. You talk about water, mm -hmm. boreholes, even though we still need more communities that need to be connected, we can talk about a number of 100 communities that are connected, at least with a hand pump uh, borehole, so that they can get good drinking water to take. Talk about education. Very few communities you go to in Ketunov that you will not see a new uh, uh, structure for their classrooms. We have done all this. So we can talk about a lot. And when it comes to students, the number of students that have assisted to the MPs Common Fund, some through my personal resources, are a lot. Mm. A lot of people have also, through my effort, have secured jobs. Today, they are earning income and they're taking care of their family and, and, and the rest. So if you talk about what I'll leave, fine, those things are there. If you go to our uh, uh, health sector, right. cheap compounds have been put up, uh, clinics have been put up, and one major one is the uh, Katunov Municipal Hospital, mm. which we put up at Hwata. I, it's a brand new hospital. I see. At Beta. In yes. Beta. Yeah. So let's do some K2 North NDC politics mm, now. Mm. Um, the May 13th primaries mm. uh, ended in a tie. Subsequently, uh, the NDC Functional Executive Committee met mm. and decided that Edem Agbana, mm. who is now your parliamentary candidate yes. for K2 North, yes. should be given the nod. Uh, w w I mean, do you understand why uh, the committee did that instead of the, you know, a rerun? No, I, I, I didn't put myself into the center of the whole issue. When this, we started, when I announced that I will not go again, there were a number of them who approached me. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, I am not going to advise anybody either go or not go. So once you come, you want to go, the road is your front. So, but what I would do is that I would try to be neutral. Right. I didn't want to support anybody because I know the politics of Ketunov. Mm -hmm. If I support Mr. A and that person wins, the rest will gang against him be said, because you got the support of the MP, that is why. And if, if that person doesn't win, again, the one who will say, I didn't get your support, so that recognition will not be there. So I will stay out. Mm. And I met them four times, all the candidates. I told them all this. So the election day, I did not vote for parliamentary. Oh, I see. Yes. I voted only presidential and I left. Mm. So when the tie came, both of them approached me. They said they have been called to the national high court. I said, look, go. Go and listen to what the national will say. Whatever decision they arrive at, accept it. Was it a just a, you know, a reasonable uh, step that you know, the, the, national, the ex executive committee had taken? Um, do you think it was the best decision? Well, it has come and it has been accepted. So I don't want us to go into deep. The, maybe I will say well, something. That, I'm, that I'm, I'm, asking, I'm asking because um, noting that this could cause problems in k 2 North, mm. uh, you were roped into a reconciliation, uh, if you like, committee mm. to you know, ensure that there is cohesion as far as the uh, k 2 North NDC is concerned. Mm. And so you embarked on talking to... No, after the decision of the National Executive Committee. Yes. And... One party didn't accept the decision because it didn't go their, their way. As a father of the constituency, it was my duty. In fact, nobody asked me, but it was my duty to talk to the losing side. Mm -hmm. So I called the, Mr. John Ad, uh, Adan mm -hmm. to my house and advised him. And he willingly accepted my position. And so when some of his supporters were, were going on demonstration or whatever, I called him again. So I did that mm. simply because... I want us to have peaceful environment for campaign in Ketunov. And the, the gentleman who was not given the slot is, is a very nice guy. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he looked into it and now both but, of them but are working But could well. this threaten the ability of the NDC to uh, hold on to Ketunov? No, it won't. You, you don't think I, this no, will be a political no, dogfight? No, no it, it won't. I think all of them have put this in behind them. Mm. And they are working together. In fact, there was recently, um, uh, what, what, that was uh, 
first, first May, mm -hmm. they had a um, uh, Jidudu Zonli, that victory walk, and which was well attended. I couldn't attend because I wasn't feeling well. So I couldn't attend. So it will not have any effect on, on that. And one thing also that will help the NDC in getting of that, the MPP strong man who always contested me, he's mm -hmm. not contesting He's not. Again. Kofi Jamezi is he's not, not contesting. contesting. Uh, that's you true. know, he contests me four times. I, I, I know. And yes. you beat him all those four all, times. All so, so, mm -hmm. so, and, and that's why I've been asking whether or not um, this may not be an easy fight for the NDC um, if your supporters are not rallying behind Edem Agbana. They will all rally behind him. All so of them it's are going rallying. to be an easy fight for yeah, you in Ketunas? It's, it's going to be an easy fight. And we are targeting 85% or more of the vote to go to NDC in Ketunov this time around. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. My guest tonight has been uh, the chair for the Public Accounts Committee. He's also a member of parliament for K2 North. Unfortunately, uh, he's not putting his cap in the fight in the 2024 uh, elections because he is retiring from parliament. But I hope that you enjoyed our conversation. It's been a very eye-opening episode of Hot Issues. I'm Kemeni Amano. Bye-bye.